Well, good morning again. Um, it's Christmas morning. I guess you're aware of that. And uh, Merry Christmas to you. Just wanted to clarify real quick that uh, some people have asked me, what exactly does your shirt mean? So I'll just say real quick, if you didn't know, I'm a drummer. I love the drums. And that is uh, symbols, uh, the greatest symbols that I think you can buy, money can buy. And so my wife gave it to me, so I thought I'd wear it on Christmas morning. Plus, it's 80 degrees outside. I thought, you know, I'm not going to wear a Christmas sweater. I'm going to wear a T-shirt. So anyway, um, Merry Christmas to you. And that's what I have in case you're wondering, what in the world does Zilogen mean? That's how you pronounce it, Zilogen. They're, they're drum symbols. That's what that means. Yes, yes. All right. Um, anyway, if you have your Bibles this morning, um, there are four biographies about Jesus in the New Testament. Um, we call those Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'd like for you to turn uh, to the third biography, which would be Luke. And we're going to look at a very popular passage of Scripture there, uh, the Christmas story, um, and turn to Luke uh, chapter 2. And uh, this, this has to do with the shepherds. Um, and we're going to look at some of that, but really this morning what we're going to do is I want us to look at the incarnation, um, what that means for you and me, and I'm going to define exactly what that means in just a second, all right? Luke chapter 2, here we go, starting in verse 8. It said, that night there were shepherds uh, staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flock of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory sh- um, And the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Hey, don't be afraid, he said, because I bring you good news that will be of great joy to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you um, you will recognize him by this sign. Here's the sign, he says. Um, You're going to find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, then, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, um, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Hey, let's go check this out. Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried to the village, and they found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart, and she thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. Now, here's what I want you to do. Let's use our imaginations for just a few minutes, all right? You don't have to just be a kid to be imaginative. I want you to use your imagination. Here's what I want you to do. And, and probably it's best to use your imagination if you're not on a cell phone, if you're not doing anything else right now, just focus on this, you know, block everything else out, all right? Imagine with me for just a moment. Here's the deal. Here's what we're going to do. That um, night after night, you do the same mundane, boring job, all right? Or day after day. Now, for some of you, you don't have to be very imaginative, right? You're going, That's wait a minute, I live there. <laughs> That's what I do. It's mundane. It's boring. But let's say for the sake of being relative to this story, you're a shepherd, all right? And what you do is you watch sheep. Are you with me? Are you there? That's what you do. Now, here's what's interesting about this. Um, You didn't earn a master's degree in shepherd keeping because, let's just be honest, you don't need a master's degree. You just watch sheep, right? It's just kind of a, a, it's nothing spectacular ever happens. You're just, maybe, maybe, you know, there's something excitement where a a wild animal tries to come and steal one of the sheep and you have to run it off. But that may be the most um, exciting night of your life and then many nights that doesn't even happen. It, you understand what I'm saying? It's just, this is just what you do. It's just life. It's just this is how you make your living. You're just simply keeping watch day and night over sheep. But then suddenly you're approached by an angel. Now imagine that. Now I would say that is not ordinary, right? That is a little bit out of the ordinary. And suddenly you, after you, re, you get over your shock of seeing an angel, you realize, wait a minute, this angel has just given me an incredible message. Actually, a life-changing message, and the message isn't just for me. The message is for everybody, right? It's a life-changing message. And, and after the angel leaves, you're left wondering, why me? 
you know, why, why of all the people in the world, why did the angel come to me? Why did the angel share this incredible news with me? And so these guys realize something special has just happened, and they cannot contain their joy. They can't, there's no way they can keep this to themselves. And so they have to go, they have to investigate, they have to find out, what are the angels talking about? Well, this morning, I want us to do the same thing. Let's investigate for just a few minutes, um, what does this, what does the incarnate nation mean? Why, as we end our series on why Christmas, we're going to look at the fact, the amazing fact that God is here. He's here. God is here on this earth, guys. This is something to get excited about, and we're going to discuss that. So let's talk about, um, and, and using Luke here as the backdrop, what is the incarnation? What does that mean exactly? Well, I'm going to define that for you in just a second. Let me give you five things about what the incarnation means. All right, here's the first one. Let me just write these down. We'll go through them quickly this morning so you can get back home to, to doing Christmas festivities. But I, I, we, you know, everything you do this morning really centers around this, all right? Um, but here's, a, here's the first thing. The incarnation means this. It means that God left the splendor of heaven to make his home among the ordinary. That's what the incarnation means. Matter of fact, go with me to John chapter 1, verse 14. John said this. Again, this is one of the biographies uh, on Jesus in John. He says, so the word, now the word just means Jesus. That's what that means there. So Jesus became human and he made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So what that means there is John is just wanting you to get, we talked about this in week one, but John wants you to get and understand that God has made his home among us. The Word has become flesh. He's become like us, all right? Matter of fact, I put this definition on your outline. I think it's on the screen as well. Here is actually the definition of an incarnation. A person who embodies in flesh a deity, a spirit, or an abstract quality. For us, that means that Jesus, he was a spirit. He was. He's a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They exist as spirit, but Jesus now embodied human flesh. That's a radical thought, guys. Absolutely radical, all right? Um, and, and it's rattled, radical and so radical that it is different from any other religious belief in the world. No other religion claims that their God has become a man. It's just, it's, it's a radical thought, all right? But it's a true thought. That's what sets Christianity apart from all other religions, and um, that's what is amazing with us. Look, look again real quick, back, back to Luke chapter 2. Let's focus on verses 8 through 12 for just a moment. It said, that night... There were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, the radiance of the Lord's glory around them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, because here's why, all right? I bring good news, good news that's going to be of great joy to all of the people, right? Not just white people, not just black people, not just Americans, not just Hispanics. I'm talking every single person. This is good news, guys, that God has moved into the neighborhood, that God has become flesh and blood. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, in the city of David. And you're going to recognize him by this sign. You're going to find him. You're going to find God like this. He's a little baby. He's wrapped in strips of cloth, or snugly, every translation you memorize that. And he's going to be laying in a feeding trough. Now, what a sign, Right? <laughs> The angel says, here's a sign. You're going to find an infant laying in a feeding trough. <laughs> That's God. You know, what a remarkable thing. So, so in other words, you're telling me, okay, God is in a smelly, cobweb, dung-infested stable, dependent now upon a couple of teenagers to care for him. That's what this means. That's what this means. That's what the incarnation means. But, guys, it also means this. It means that God loves you so much that he is willing to become like you and experience what you experience. Don't miss that. God is so insanely in love with us that he is willing to become like us to experience what we experience, to live like we live. Guys, that's love. That's love. There is no greater definition of love. And, and I want to I note this, too. He didn't have to do it. He did not have to do it. It was a choice that he made. He chose to leave the splendor of heaven, the glory of heaven, and come a live among the filthy and the ordinary. That's a remarkable thought. And he did it because he's motivated by love, because he is love, all right? He did it. Uh, he actually did it for several reasons, which we're going to continue to look at here. But that's the first one, is that I want you to understand the, arc the incarnation just, just very basically means God left the splendor of heaven and made his home among the ordinary for 33 years. That's what that means. Here's the second thing, though, I want you to get, all right? 
Second thing is this, that, and uh, God, we're going to kind of contrast these two. The rest of them, we're going to kind of do that. God gave his only son so that we could become his children. Now think about what a radical thought that is. That God gave his only son so that we could become his children. Look at, look at these verses. Let me just give you some. I'm going to rattle them off real quick. John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. I, just, look, just, just stop for just one second. Because there's not a single one of us in this room that really has the right to be called a child of God. Because every one of us have rebelled against God. Every one of us have run away from God. But by the fact that Jesus became a man, it now gives us a right, if we choose him, to become God's children again. All right? So he says, all who believe and accept, and he gave the right to become children. And they are reborn. This is not some physical you know, birth resulting from the passion, a human passion plan, but this is a birth. This is a rebirth. It's a spiritual birth that can only come from God. And then John, in, his, in another letter he wrote, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, See how very much the Father loves us? For he calls us his children, that, and that's what we are. And Guys, just get that. We are God's children. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't hear him. Dear friends, we are already God's children. Then look at Galatians. I love how Paul puts it. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the right time came, see, God is always right. He's not early. He's not late. He's, he's right on time. And, and whatever reason, over 2,000 years ago, this is when God chose to come, all right? And at the right time, Paul says, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Um, again, he says, right at the right, over 2,000 years ago, God has sent his son, born of a woman. She was subject to the laws of nature just like every other woman is. Jesus was subject to the laws of nature just like every man is, right? Um, but... Because of that, we have the right to become his children. Now, here's, here's what I want you to understand. Let's go back to verse 14 of chapter 2. Look at this with me, of Luke chapter 2. It says, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Let me ask you a question. All right? You just, you just well, you can answer it out loud or to yourself. Would you say there's peace on earth right now? Yeah. So what in the world does this verse mean? When, when, when the angels declare, listen, Jesus is coming so that you and I could have peace. Well, let's talk about peace for just a second because you, with, this is what enables you to be a friend of God. All right? Here's what I mean by this. All right? The Bible here is not, when it talks about peace in general, it's not talking about a general peace or prosperity or a trouble-free life. That is not what peace means. All right? Peace means an end to hostility and warfare. That's what it means. Peace means this, and, and get this, the most important and fundamental thing that one can possess in this life, you know what it is? What's the most important thing, the most fundamental thing that you and I can possess in life? It's peace with God. It's peace with God. It's Jesus, yeah. It's Jesus. The, only, the, the most important thing in this world is peace with God because here's why. Every single one of you one day will face God. And let me tell you what, you do not want to be at odds or hostile to, toward God when you meet him. So the most fundamental thing in life is to be at peace with God, all right? And here's why. The natural, it's very natural, the human heart, here's the deal. You know what the human heart wants? It wants to be king, right? Every one of us wants to be. That's our human nature. We want to be king. And so once, you know, we realize that, uh, so we realize we're hostile toward God's claim of lordship over our lives because that's what God's saying. He's saying, listen, uh, you are not in charge of your life. I am in charge of your life. I'm going to be Lord over your life. And you're like, wait a minute, hold on a second. I mean, we see this in children, right? Every child rebels. Every child, you know, they, they want to know how far mom and dad are going to go, what they can get away with. And we do the same thing with God. Wait a minute, you're saying, God, that you have to have total authority over my life? Total authority? And, and so we, we, and because of that, with, with that, we are hostile toward God. We, we don't have peace, all right? And, of course, this self-centered control leads to conflict with other human beings, right? Many of us have been at odds or maybe at odds with somebody else right now. And thus, because we don't have any peace with God, we don't have any peace with man, all right? There's no peace on earth because there's no peace with God. But here is the proclamation of Christmas. Here it is, right here. It's, it's, it's in verse 14 
Um, what does the song say that we sing? God and sinners, what? God and sinners reconciled. God and sinners reconciled. Guys, Jesus, as Reggie pointed out for us, is the perfect mediator between two estranged parties. There is no other person on this planet that could mediate between God and man when we're not at peace with one another. By Jesus assuming a human nature, the God-man, here's what he does. This is awesome. He bridges that chasm. He dies for our sins. He closes the gap, and he makes peace. Now, all we have to do is this. You've got to recognize that there's a conflict between us and God, and you've got to trust Jesus to heal that conflict and become children of God. And guys, when you, are, when you then become children of God, guess what? You are at peace with God. But the most fundamental thing, do not leave here today without understanding and asking yourself the most important question, am I at peace today with God? If you can answer that question assuredly, soundly with a yes, then you can lay your head on the pillow and I can go to sleep with no problems. But if there's a question in your heart about that, that's, well, then you're not going to sleep soundly. All right? So here's the third thing the incarnation means. It means this. It means that God became poor so that we could become rich. This is the third aspect of the incarnation. Actually, let's go to, well, again to Paul. He says this in 2 Corinthians 8 9. He says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Now, guys, this is an incredible thought. This is deep theology right here. Let me ask you this question. How do you define rich? Uh, just in your mind, immediately, how do you define rich? Well, what's, okay, blessed? Debt free. De debt free, all right. Yeah. Maybe, you know, you know the definition of rich for some is, uh, is it Donald Trump? I mean, because his name's been in the media a lot lately because he's going to be our new president, right? You know, and it, I mean, you, you know you're rich when you're moving into the White House and you're downgrading, right? That, you know, so maybe, maybe Donald Trump is the definition of rich. But take it even further because now not only is he a billionaire, but he's now holding probably, the, well, no doubt, the highest office in our land, but maybe in the whole world, right? So now coupled with that richness comes that power. Maybe that's it. Is that the definition of rich? Or maybe, maybe just put it more simpler terms, maybe this morning you feel rich simply because you opened some presents and you've got some money or you've got some gifts and you just kind of feel like a king for the day, all right? It's, it's, maybe it's all the cool stuff that you've acquired. Maybe that's what makes you rich. Well, here's what I want you to do. You, you have to think past the right now, all right? You've got to think past the riches of this world because that is not what's going to make you rich at all. That is not why Jesus died. Jesus did not die and have wise men come from the east to bring him gold, uh, frankincense, gold, and myrrh so that you and I could open Christmas presents this morning. <laughs> That's not what it means to be rich, all right? That's an added bonus, and I'm thankful for my New Zealand t-shirt that most of you don't know what it means, all right? I'm thankful for those things, but that's not what Christmas is about, all right? Um, and when we begin to realize this, that one day we're going to be with God in heaven forever, that is what our true riches are. That's the definition of being rich. See, listen, we inherit that which Jesus left to be with us. Are you with me? We're going to, guys, listen, you're going to inherit heaven. You are going to inherit heaven because you're a child of God. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes you very rich. If you didn't get it, let me help you try to comprehend it, all right? Um, I, this came from a book I read by Dr. Hugh Ross, um, and he helps describe exactly what the new creation is going to be like. One day, and we're not going to get into all that this morning, but one day the old heaven and the old earth are going to pass away, and one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And in this new creation, it's going to be nothing like you know now. Let me put it this way. You cannot even fathom, you cannot even imagine in your wildest imaginations what this new creation is going to be like. But let me try to help you with through Scripture, give you a couple of pictures. Matter of fact, I'm going to put a couple of bullet points up here so you can even read it. Here's the first thing I want you to understand, how, how rich you are becoming. In the new creation, guess what? There will never be darkness. And now this is a, this is a powerful thing. There's going to be no need for lamps, sun, or stars because this new creation is going to radiate light. So, in other words, it's not going to be electro, uh, electric, um, electric 
electromagnetic light. I'll get it out in a minute, all right? It's not, that's what it's like. It's not going to be that. It's not going to be lights we have you, you flip on a switch. Heaven is, is there's going to be no darkness there because Jesus is that light. But let's keep going. Uh, we're going to have access to a planet far larger and more beautiful than ours now. Anything that you, as big as this earth is or as little as this earth is, you go to Disney World, they say it's a small world after all anyway, right? But no matter how big it is, it does, it's not even going to compare to the earth or, or the world or the new creation that we're going to have one day. Get this one. Space is no longer going to separate people. Did you know that? And, and it's going to be, I'm not really sure I can explain that, but there's going to be a oneness with one another that's very similar to the oneness of the Trinity of God. You're going to be able to communicate with one another. Um, I mean, it's just, you're just going to be there. It's going to be spectacular. And then I love this. No activity will be wasted or meaningless in the new creation. Think about that, because we waste a lot of time, folks. <laughs> we waste a lot of time. And I love this. You are never going to have to wonder or doubt about your purpose or your worth again, ever, in heaven. You will never, you'll never want, what, it, it, what's my purpose in life? In some sense, according to Scripture, uh, we will likely lead, instruct, and govern angels, is what the Bible tells us. And it's possible that as redeemed humans, we will be ruling and instructing advanced creatures who are distinct from both human beings and angels. You can find that in Revelation. It's spectacular what God's going to do. Also, look at this next bullet point. Everyone is going to be taught by God, according to John 6, 45. That means thus they're going to be filled with knowledge and understanding. Each individual will be fascinating to communicate with. Now get that. Every single human being that you come in contact with in the new creation is going to be fascinating to communicate with. They're going to be overflowing with kindness and compassion, and they're going to be more attractive than you could even describe or imagine. And look at this next line. You will never run into another obnoxious person. <laughs> Ever. All right? Um, that, that even means that you and I will not be obnoxious. Okay? <laughs> and then one of the greatest pictures of the things that makes you rich, this is why you want to be a child of God, is that we will, all of us will be family. Marriage and family relationships, as we know them today, uh, they're going to be replaced. There will not be marriage in heaven. It's going to be replaced by something far more intimate, something more pure and wonderful that, that, that we would never miss, even the best part of what we enjoy here, including sexual intimacy. It's, it's going to be even greater than that. Every human being in the new creation will possess the capacity to, to maintain multiple simultaneous relationships, just like the triune God does. All of that is going to happen in, in heaven. And of course, finally, guys, the, one of the greatest things that we know and we love is that there will, it will be impossible. Um, the earth right now is decaying. It, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it, it will eventually collapse. It will come to, God planned it that way, how we know it. That will not happen. There will be no decay in the new creation, ever. You will never die again. You will never ache again. You will never have a broken heart again. You will never hurt again. You will never suffer again. All of that. Let me tell you what. Now, think of the greatest Christmas gift you opened this morning. Does it even compare? <laughs> There's no way. And yet, that's what we do. We, 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 we store up our treasures on earth. And we think, if I just have this, if I just have that, that's wealth. And I'm telling you guys, by God becoming one of us, he became poor. He became nothing so that you and I could become the richest people in the world. And it's only rich because of the salvation of Jesus. So do you see what it means to really be rich? Do you see that? No matter how much or how little you have in your checking account right now, you're rich. <laughs> you're rich. It, that means nothing. It's knowing Jesus. Because when we repent and we make peace with God and we become his children, we inherit all that's his. And that's an awesome thought. Let me give you the fourth thing that uh, the incarnation means. We've got two more, and then we'll be done here. This one, though, guys, is, is so important. God suffered so that we could be comforted. God suffered so that we could be comforted. Again, Christmas shows you a God unlike the God of any other faith. All right? Let me ask you a question, and you don't, again, you don't have to answer this out loud. They're more rhetorical. Just answer them to yourself, but have you ever been betrayed? Ha have you ever been lonely? 
Have you ever been destitute? Maybe even have you ever faced death? Well, guess what? Jesus faced every one of those things, every single one, and even more so, right? Let's, let's look at what it says in the book of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews says this, chapter 2, verses 7 18. Therefore, it was necessary for him, him being Jesus, to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and his sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. He had, in other words, he had to suffer in order for you and I to find reconciliation with God. Then he could offer a, a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Do you, do you get that? Since he himself has gone through suffering and he has gone through testing, he can help you when you are being tested. Don't miss this part of the Christmas story, guys. Guys, do not leave Jesus in a manger singing Silent Night, Holy Night, even though we just sang that song and it was awesome and it was beautiful and I loved how we ended at acapella. Don't, leave, don't you dare leave Jesus there because you will miss the entire Christmas story if you do. He was not born to stay in a manger. All right? Guys, Every one of us hurt. Every one of us has been hurt. Every single one of us has faced disappointment. Every single one of us has faced loss. Well, so what, guess what? So has God. All right? And therefore, he can sympathize with us when we are hurting. Um, the, incarnation, the incarnation means that God suffered and that Jesus triumphed from, from, through that suffering. Jesus, guys, has infinite power. To come for us. And let me ask you this. Have you ever, have you ever prayed something? You ever prayed a prayer and it just it, it didn't get answered? Or at least the way you wanted it? I mean, you just been, you've, been, you've been asking for something and you did not get it. Or maybe you had a Christmas list item this year and you didn't get it, right? And maybe it wasn't a prayer. But, but can I tell you this? Did you know that Jesus once asked for something through a prayer that he didn't get? It's called, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, if you can take this away from me, this suffering, this pain, this hurt, what I'm about to encounter, please do it. But it's not about me. It's not my will. Even in his humanity, even though he's fully divine and fully man, in his humanity, he said, it's not about my will, but it's about yours, Father. And God did not answer his request. You and I have gone before God asking for certain things, and it has not been answered. And that hurts. It's disappointing, and we question, and we struggle, and we wonder why. Can I just tell you, God has been where you are. And that's why I love Jesus, because I can relate to him, and he can relate to me. Christianity says that God has been all the places that you have been. He has been in the darkness that you're in now, and much more. Come on, he was crucified, and the sin of the world was placed upon him. And therefore above all other deities or man-made gods or other religions, that's why you can trust Jesus. That and that alone is why you can trust him. You can rely on him because he has the power to comfort, to strengthen, and to bring you through whatever you're going through right now. That is the beauty of the incarnation. I know of no other god or religion that offers that, or if they do, they can't even back it up. Only Christianity can. Finally, let me give you the last thing this morning that I love about this. It, it, the, the incarnation means this, that the good news of Christmas is for just you alone. No, it's for everyone. It's for everyone. Everyone. Don't miss that. Now look, how do I know that? Well, look who the angels came to. Let's go back to Luke chapter 2. Let's, let's finish here with verses 15 and 20. We read them earlier, but let's read them one more time. Now when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem, and let's, let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Just, just pause. I mean, again, you've got to be imagined here. You've got to stop and think. All you do night after night is watch sheep. Now this fierce, gruesome messenger of God shows up and says, hey, by the way, God is here. He's just down the road from you. Go check it out. And the angel now leaves, and the heavenly host is left, and they're sitting there, and one of them finally slaps another shepherd upside the head and says, maybe we ought to go check this out. What do you think, you know? So let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem. Forget what, yeah, may, I don't know, maybe another one's going, well, what about the sheep? Forget the sheep, man. 
Forget them. God is born. God is here. Let's go find this. Let's go see what he's talking about. And so they take off and they go to Bethlehem and they hurried to the village and they found Mary and Joseph. They came upon the real nativity. They came upon that scene. And there was the baby. And it, just as the angel said, he was lying in a manger. And after seeing him, notice what happened. The shepherds told who? Everyone. Everyone. What had happened, what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept these things in her heart and thought about them often. Then the shepherds went back to their flocks, and here's what they did. They were glorifying and praising God for they had uh, heard and for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Guys, the best part about the incarnation, or one of the best parts, is the fact that it's not just for the elite. It's not just for the wealthy. It is for every single human being. God, the angels did not show up to Caesar in his palace that night. The angels did not show up to the Pharisees, the religious right, the guys who had all the degrees on the wall. He didn't, they didn't show up there. They didn't show up to the, to the aristocrats or the wealthy in Jerusalem. They showed up to the shepherds, the ones who needed God. We all need God. But see, the shepherds, they were the lowliest of the low. And God shows up to them, all right? And, and they were just simply watching their flocks by night, and God shows up to them. The incarnation is for everyone. Now, I want you to notice two things happen once the, once the shepherds receive this story. They go to Bethlehem, and they see, and when they get done, they can't help but they do this. They go, and the passage says they told everyone what they witnessed. And in a sense, they were the world's first evangelist, <laughs> right? And don't get scared by that word, because a lot of times we talk about evangelists. Evangelist is just simply someone who shares the good news. If you've told anybody lately about what God's done, you're an evangelist, all right? It's just, that's all that means, all right? But, and that's exactly what they did. They couldn't help. But listen, they just went to Bethlehem. They found Jesus lying in a manger. They have gazed upon the face of God. You better believe they're going to tell somebody what just happened. They, there was an excitement. Listen, I have to tell you. Listen, let me tell you what I've seen, what I've heard, what I've experienced. It's life-changing. Guys, the same thing should be for you and me. We should be shouting it from the rooftops what today means. We have seen, we've experienced Jesus. He's changed us radically, so we need to be telling others about it. That's what they experience. That is our job. But you know what's interesting here? You know what the Scripture says? It says that, look at the top there. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. Now, when I first read that, and there's other translations that use other words, I got kind of excited about that. Like, yeah, but can I just stop and pause for a second? To be astonished is not the same thing as accepting and believing. Are you with me? And I just want to tell you this. As you are sharing the greatest news in the world with some people, they may be amazed at your story. They may be thrilled with what God has done in your life, but they refuse to accept and believe what's happened to you. So be it. But the, the, the shepherds still could not help but go and share what had happened. Some may be astonished. Some may be bored. Some may accept. But it's still our responsibility to share. And then here's the second thing that I thought was interesting. It, it was this. The last thing they did, and I think it's a responsibility that you and, you and I have. Verse 20 at the end there, it says, I underlined it. The shepherds went back to their flocks. Now listen, is this, this is what it's saying is, as they were going, as they, they, didn't, they didn't go back to church. They didn't go find a temple. It says, on the way back to their mundane, boring jobs, what were they doing? They were praising and glorifying God. You know what that tells me, guys? In the midst of everything you and I do, whether it's our jobs, whether it's, it's, it's just you know, grocery shopping, whether it's working um, you know, in the neighborhood, whatever we're doing, on our way there, we have got to be glorifying and praising God because, guys, this is the greatest news in the world. God has become a man to save us. And they were astonished by this. You see, a true encounter with Jesus changes you. It wrecks you to the point where you can't help but share that joy with others. And it also causes you to praise God and glorify Him. So, this morning, this is what I just say to you as your pastor in closing. All right, Let there be joy in your heart and let there be praise on your lips. 
this morning. Um, yes, I want you to go home today and enjoy your gifts that you've received. I want you to cherish family time that you're going to have together. But just remember, all of those things are only possible because of Jesus. Amen. He and He alone should be the focal point of your conversations today. Parents, as your kids are open and presents are playing with them, remind them of the greatest gift ever. Say, enjoy those gifts. We, we love you. This is just an example of how much we love you because this is how much God loves us. You know, there's nothing wrong with presents. I'm all for them, actually, right? But remember that Jesus is the reason for the season. The incarnation means so many things, but it ultimately means that God became one of us. Emmanuel, God is with us. And we are not left on our own. We are not left to figure this thing called life out. God sent himself to us, and therefore, you and I have hope. Amen? And so this morning... I just want to simply wish you a Merry Christmas, and I want to thank you for being here, but I want us to celebrate the real meaning of Christmas, and that's the fact that God has become flesh and blood. Let's, um, I'd say what, let me ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then I've asked the band to come up, and um, we're going to sing uh, Joy to the World again, because I want us to leave here in a triumphal celebration. Um, and then after we sing that, we'll take up our regular tithes and offerings. But just pray with me real quick. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for your glorious plan of salvation. Um, as that song says, it seems like such a strange way to save the world, but yet that's what you did. God, you sent yourself in the form of a human being, in the form of a man, to save us. It's brilliant. There is no other religion in the world to even come close. Well, they're all false anyway. God, you are the one true God. And Jesus, we are lost without you. So this morning, as we close our time together, God, we just want to celebrate joy to the world. I have joy. I have peace. I, I'm no longer at odds with God, but I, I have made amends with him. And I can stand before the God of the universe one day face to face. In awe, prostrate, bowing before him, but I can stand in front of him knowing that all is well with my soul. Jesus, thank you for that. Thank you for that peace that only you can bring. In Christ's name we pray, amen.